Ladies and gentlemen, my name is, boy, I forgot my name. My name is Lenore von Stein, and this is yet another episode of The Facts. And this episode is about torture, uh, 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 the goals and the effects of torture. And sitting with me today are uh, three people, uh, Christine Husky, uh, James Cullen, and Taylor Pendergrass. And we're going to talk about, um, I, 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 I saw all these people, I went to, uh, Tom Duane, State Senator Tom Duane, has a bill about uh, decertifying medical personnel in New York State who are involved in torture as a way to, to you know, make some inroads into this practice. And uh, this is where I saw th these people. They were among the people that testified on that bill. Um, so what is this? Uh, t uh, can, can you give more detail about this Tom Duane bill? Taylor, about this, uh, what, what is it about? Sure. Well, for a little bit of context, let me just start with um, the way in which I think the bill first came to the attention, both of Senator Duane and probably a lot of other people in New York and the United States. I think that when revelations regarding torture in Guantanamo first started to come out, many people were aware of the role of military personnel in that torture. What people may have been less aware about, <clears throat> at least at the beginning, was the role of civilians, and in particular, the role of medical and mental health professionals in designing that torture regime and implementing it. Um, some of those revelations came as a result of FOIA requests and then subsequent lawsuits to obtain information from the Department of Defense. And FOIA is that Information Freedom of Information Act? Yes, I'm sorry. It's the open records requirement that mm -hmm. is imposed on the federal government. And when some of those documents started to be released and the role of medical and mental health professionals in torture at Guantanamo started to really be realized, I think, by both the American public and also lawmakers and policymakers, it became clear that uh, many of these professionals had been intimately involved with not only designing the torture regime, but in some cases, in the case of one particular New York licensed psychologist, actually participating in the torture of detainees at Guantanamo. So as a result of those revelations, which I think we'll talk about more at length here, are historically not that uncommon for medical professionals to play a role in torture, there became a movement both nationally and in New York to both seek some accountability for the folks who had participated in those actions and to try to make sure that that would be ended going forward and there would never be a situation again where there was any doubt about the fact that medical and mental health professionals should have no role at all when torture was involved. If they didn't have a role, how would they have torture? Is it standard, this medical personnel in torture? I mean, does that put a big dent in the action? Um, speaking uh, as a uh, director of the anti-torture program at Positions for Human Rights, which is uh, sort of doctor uh, medical based, uh, d doctors and psychologists have always had a role in torture because uh, essentially they are the calibrators of harm to the person's body and psyche. Um, and, and sort of in a, in a very kind of mechanical way, they are able to, um, to adjust how, how far to, to take it so that person is broken, basically. Um, I mean, certainly torture happens without the involvement of doctors, but I think in sort of a systematic way, doctors and psychologists are, uh, have, have always, have, you know, play a big role. And the, the legislation in New York, and I should add there's pending legislation in Massachusetts as well, um, and other, other states are, I think, uh, looking to, to also have legislation, uh, is, to, is to really take that, you know, take that, uh, that, the role of the doctor and the healthcare professional you know, out of it, so that it, so that the system of interrogation, course of interrogation, sort of comes crumbling down. I think that many people in the healthcare profession believe uh, that without the doctors and psychologists, you you could not have the interrogation system that occurred at Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib and other places. Uh huh. So it, it, it could end it. It could end it essentially. It could, or turn it back in, in, into its medieval roots. 
rather than uh, um, so w w why w why use it? Well, I I think from uh, a military perspective, it uh, it has no legitimate use, and I say this as a retired uh, army general and a judge advocate officer. Reliance on torture is just going to lead you into bad areas. Um, we know from experience that if information comes solely from torture, mistreatment of prisoners, you're not going to be able to rely on it. There are really two classes of victims of torture. There is a much larger percentage of people uh, who, and I would include myself in this number, at some point will say anything to stop torture. It has nothing to do with truth or accuracy. It will depend upon what the victim thinks the torturer wants to hear. And the victim will say whatever it is they want to hear. Another very much smaller group have been trained in counter-interrogation techniques or they are ideologues. They will make an assumption that at some point in time they're going to be captured. And they will typically have a prepackaged story ready to tell the interrogators. At a small unit level, and certainly in Vietnam, we would have cautioned our people against relying on information that came from South Vietnamese uh, forces where torture was used in so-called tiger cages and other uh, places. Because what experience taught is when you acted at the small unit level on a tactical basis on that <clears throat> information derived from torture is that the person who was questioned, realizing they could be captured, would now put into effect a pre-planned operation. They would hold out for a period of time, realizing that this would add legitimacy to whatever they were going to say. They would then say, for example, oh yes, there's a cache of arms hidden in this particular part of the jungle or in this warehouse in some built-up area. An American unit would then be dispatched to go out and seize those weapons. Well, by virtue of the capture of the person who was being interrogated, his cell or unit now knew to go into action to set up a pre-planned ambush of those who were going to come out in search of that information, leading to disastrous consequences. That's an example of what happens at a tactical small unit level. We have an example at a more strategic level when uh, General uh, Powell, then Secretary of State, was lied to by senior people in the CIA when he was told prior to going before the United Nations to give justification for the invasion of Iraq that there were, uh, there was intelligence to show ties between Al-Qaeda and Saddam Hussein. This was utter nonsense to anyone familiar with the Mideast at the time because of anyone uh, that Saddam feared, it was religious fanatics that you would find in Al-Qaeda. But of course, that information, common sense as it was, was screened out. Well, <clears throat> uh, we also know that the weapons of mass destruction nonsense had no valid intelligence base. But nevertheless, uh, General Powell, acting in good faith on what the CIA had told him, went before the world to justify the invasion. The only thing I think worse than his personal embarrassment when he realized that he was lied to was the enormity of the impact on the American people and our military for going to war based upon false information. The single source of information on the Al-Qaeda uh, ties to Saddam Hussein was somebody who was picked up in Afghanistan and was cooperating with military intelligence, giving us very good information based upon the most wonderful of human motivations. He wanted revenge against some of his former, uh, his fellow members of the Taliban. And that is the kind of motivation we love to see in military intelligence. It's revenge. It's all of the typical things that motivate, motivate people to give you the truth. Well, <clears throat> in this particular case, although this guy had been giving us information, the information had proved reliable and it was valuable on a tactical level, 
the CIA came in after being authorized by the White House and took control of all of the so-called high-value detainees, this fellow being one of them. After roughing him up, they took him to Egypt, where he was subjected to, shall we say, enhanced interrogation, to put their branding name on it. And this fellow really should have been in Hollywood as a screenwriter, because he knew exactly what his audience wanted to hear. He had a wonderful story for them saying that, oh, indeed there were uh, ties between Saddam Hussein and the Taliban. A lot of nonsense. He was put on the plane, sent back to, um, uh, to Bagram in Afghanistan, and told his military intelligence interrogators, who had treated him properly and who were getting intelligence from him in the tried and true methods, what had happened. But that information and the retraction of his so-called confession with the Egyptians never was given to General Powell. He was lied to. So there is an example of where we made a terrible strategic error based upon information obtained through torture. We simply should never rely on such information. There are good ways to obtain information. The Army assembled an interrogation manual based on the lessons learned in World War II, where we interrogated uh, some of the senior Nazis following the fall of Nazi Germany. And this was in the lead up of the Nuremberg uh, trials. And what they found was that the most effective way of getting information from these guys was to take them out of their prison cells and when weather permitted, take them down to a yard where they set up chess boards. And over a couple of weeks, they established a rapport with each one of these guys and obtained from them crucial information to prosecute in a very effective way the other defendants. So they were ratting out one another. We found out they really hated one another on many levels or they were jealous of one another or they bore resentments. All great impetus for getting good information. Based upon those lessons, the Army put together a manual of interrogation, a field manual. And that manual remained the standard within the Army, and indeed, its effectiveness was such that all of the other services adopted it as well. It had 16 techniques of interrogation, all of which would be familiar to any experienced detective. The one thing it was absolute in, it prohibited torture or any mistreatment of a prisoner because it recognized that's not going to get you reliable information. Were there tricks in it? Of course there were tricks in it. Just like an experienced detective will occasionally use tricks in his interrogation, never fists, never threats to get good information. We always followed that manual because it did produce good, reliable information. The military is concerned about getting information, first of all, to ensure that information is there to protect your own troops, and secondly, to help you fulfill whatever that mission is. Once you engage in torture, you are going to lose a vital source of your information, which is the local population. They are certainly not going to support you and give you the information that is crucial to your mission and protection of your troops when you are mistreating their husbands, brothers, and fathers. This information about what your conduct is will get out. Further, your allies are going to be afraid to even cooperate with you. Now, the British perfected torture in the Adan and in Cyprus and Northern Ireland, but they were so put off by what we were doing that they refused to participate in some of our detention programs because of what they both knew and feared was happening there. Let me, let me ask, let me, in some of the subtleties of the new torture techniques, the new enhanced, if there are subtleties, right? Mm. The, for instance, <clears throat> the psychologist that, the, that you, the case, you were involved in this case, what, what uh, to make, these subtleties in place, obviously, to make torture a, a surer deal, a surer deal in terms of making it work, making it... Well, there, there are a couple aspects, I think, that touch on points that both you raised and that Christine has raised. And, you know, one of the things that's quite clear from the documents that were obtained uh, subsequent to the torture regime is that the Bush administration, and particularly Secretary Rumsfeld, absolutely demanded 
and wanted the participation of medical and mental health professionals in the design and implementation of the torture regime. Dr. John Lesso, who is a New York licensed psychologist and the subject of some litigation that my organization, the National, um, the New York Civil Liberties Union has been a part of, was actually originally trained and uh, spent much of his military career helping soldiers to know what torture to expect if they were captured behind enemy lines and how they could resist that torture. Dr. Lesso was tapped specifically because of his training and expertise as a psychologist. Seer. 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 Survival, Evasion, Resistance, yes. and Escape right. was the acronym for the military training program that Dr. Lesso was involved with. He was actually tapped by the Bush administration, by Secretary Rumsfeld, in particular to uh, reverse engineer what he knew about the psychological consequences of torture in a manner that at least the Bush administration believed would produce information from detainees at Guantanamo and at other military bases related to the war on terror. So the military training was very much part and parcel of what they wanted to accomplish. And if I could add to that, um, I mean, in some ways, you know, some of the sort of very physical, and you, Jim, you were saying, you no, know, we don't use fists, but I think mm -hmm. the, I mean, it's much more sophisticated than that. Um, you know, did physical torture happen and physical abuse? Yes, but the interrogation program is really around sort of the manipulation of the senses. And um, I'll tell you, when I first went to Guantanamo, uh, when I represented detainees back then, um, and you know, literally was one of the first lawyers to go down there, and so was hearing directly from my clients what they were being subject to, uh, which included things like, you know, lights on 24-7, extreme hot and cold temperatures, extreme isolation for extended periods of time, months at a time, not just days, you know, not just three days. Um, we all saw that Law and Order uh, episode, but, uh, you know, things like that, uh, um, you know, lack of, um, in fact, you know, medical treatment withheld, um, things like that. And I was, you know, completely shocked um, by it and did not really put two and two together until some of the documents started coming out which showed that these were, you know, these were not just sort of random um, conditions of confinement that they were subject to, that all of those conditions were put in place by psychologists. Um, sleep deprivation, isolation, all of those, uh, and Physicians for Human Rights has done a number of reports on the effects of that. So you were asking uh, earlier, you had mentioned what are the effects on a victim of torture of things like psychological um, torture and such. Uh, and I mean, we are talking, you know, physical effects of sleep deprivation. Uh, severe, you know, severe anxiety, chronic anxiety, pathological stress that leads to, um, you know, the breakdown of the nervous system, cognitive impairment, you know, um, inability to, to to make decisions, memory loss, um, you know, things that things that also affect your um, your nervous system, your your you know, cardiovascular system, um, and that was all, as Taylor said, put in place by physicians and psychologists. You know, the, as I'm listening to Christine quite correctly catalog what the elements of this program were, I am just thinking from a military point of view that all of those things were leading to a degradation of the sources of the intelligence upon which we depend. It was so counterproductive in a common sense sort of a way that you wonder where were the adults who designed this program. Where were they? <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I, not just you know <clears throat> a flippant, but 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 what 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 are they getting after? You know, what are they? What are they? What is this whole? I guess you know when when it became. Why did the the fact that people were getting tortured, enhanced, interrogated? Mm -hmm. How did that become public? Well, initially, it, uh, I think it made its way into the media screen in late April of 2004 when photos of detainees at Abu Ghraib were, were published. And in the aftermath of that, Secretary of Defense Rumfeld said what, what we were seeing was simply the products, the isolated products of a few bad apples. And I can tell you as a, as a uh, retired officer, it sounded plausible. Uh, I wanted to believe that. 
But then in the months following, we began to hear, uh, thanks to the Naval Criminal Investigative Service and uh, soldiers who were, and sailors, who were so offended by what they were seeing that they were moving these reports up the chain. And <clears throat> you realize that there were patterns of misconduct appearing. The humiliation of the teenagers to go after the, uh, to trade on the sexual taboos, uh, very prevalent in Arab culture. They were, they were all horrendous to us as well. You realize at a certain point of time when you see patterns of misconduct, any prosecutor will say, coincidence is rarely a credible explanation. There's something going on. And then thanks to uh, lawsuits uh, brought by Taylor's organization and others, we then saw the memos that were created within the Bush administration that sought to rede redefine torture, trivialize the Geneva Conventions, and sought to undermine all of the values upon which the military training and our national values had rested since the very beginnings of our republic. I mean, the military tradition against torturing or mistreating prisoners goes back to General Washington. When the Battle of New York was fought, or the Battle of Long Island more properly, uh, there was about 2,500 Americans taken captive, and they were confined to two old sugar houses and a, a prison ships in, uh, in Brooklyn. Within a year, only 800 of them were still alive. When word of this got to Congress, it coincided with another report where seven militia, American militiamen, were taken captive in a minor skirmish in Metuchen, New Jersey. They were brutally clubbed to death by their British captors within moments after surrender. People in Congress were understandably furious when they read these reports and demanded retaliation. But Washington, thankfully, uh, set a different standard. He ordered his troops not to retaliate, and instead he issued an order that <clears throat> the British prisoners, including the Hessians, were to be given uh, food, housing, and medical care, in no case inferior to that afforded to American prisoners. Uh, I'm sorry, to American soldiers. And his wisdom in setting this policy at the very beginning proved fruitful in very short order. When we fought the British at Saratoga, they surrendered to us, an army of over 6,500 with valuable weapons and arms and all that we needed at that time. And later, they surrendered at Yorkville, an even larger army, because they knew that when they were taken prisoner by the Americans, they would be treated appropriately. That formed our view. It was reinforced in the Civil War when Lincoln asked a, an immigrant professor uh, up at uh, Columbia Law School, Franz Lieber, to write out what was then the common understanding in international law as to proper conduct and improper conduct uh, in warfare. And Professor Lieber wrote a short bullet point treatise for Lincoln that was adopted by the Union Army as a general order. The Confederate Army later, in, in fairly short order, began to follow the Lieber Code as it became to be known. Uh, within months after its adoption by the uh, Union Army. The Europeans looking at this Lieber Code began to adopt some of its features in the late 1800s. It found its way into the Hague Convention in 1907 and in the first Geneva Convention in 1929. So America has always been at the forefront of prohibiting torture and directing the proper treatment of prisoners taken into its custody. Until 9-11. Until 9-11. Until I mean, you know, I have to say it because, you know, right after 9-11, and I remember this very clearly, um, when the administration said the Geneva Conventions don't apply, uh, you know, uh, international human rights treaties don't apply, the Constitution doesn't apply, and it is when you have that lack of law, I mean, that's you know, that's definitely something I learned from doing all the Guantanamo litigation is just what the rule of law means. We're going to, we're going to, it's amazing. We, we've just, we've done, we're, we're at the end of our, our conversation. And uh, we're going to continue this conversation. They're going to be broadcast as two separate episodes. Uh, 
but we will continue this uh, conversation. We're going to continue it right now, but you're not going to see it in another episode. So uh, I want to thank you all for being here today, Christine, Jim. Taylor, there'll be little signs under all of us telling okay. the audience who we are, you know, <laughs> as we go through this. And uh, thank you again uh, for uh, watching the facts. We got like, what, 30 seconds or something? I'm getting the 30 second mark. Um, and uh, I guess I think if things don't work, then, um, then the goal is something else. That's why I called it the goals and effects, and that's what I'm, I, I, I'd like to talk to talk about as we continue this conversation. So, everybody out there, stay tuned.